Good afternoon. I'm Jesse Kratz, historian of the National Archives. I would like to welcome everyone to the National Archives McGowan Theater in Washington, D.C., and a special welcome to everyone who's joining us from across the country on YouTube. In celebration of American Archives Month, we put together this special program about a record group that's near and dear to my heart, RG64, Records of the National Archives. Long neglected, the archives has recently made processing this collection a priority. Alan Walker has been assigned to process this collection, and today he's here to share some of the interesting discoveries he has made. Alan is an archivist in the textual processing unit at the National Archives in College Park. He received his MA from, in history from the George Mason University. Alan is a frequent contributor to the National Archives Internal Collaboration Network, where you can find him at Alan Walker's blog or read his many posts in the history of the National Archives. I am pleased to introduce Alan Walker to give his talk, Origin Stories, Discovering the Records of the National Archives. Welcome. I'm so glad to be here today to share with you some of the history of the National Archives as told by the records themselves. Working with archival records, I've always been intrigued by those smaller stories that help to tell the larger one, what I'd like to call microhistory, what you might call trivia. Since I started working here a few years ago, my curiosity has naturally gravitated to the history of this place. I've long had questions like, when did we start using cardboard boxes to house records? Or what was it like to work here during those tumultuous years of World War II? And simply, what was it like to work here way back then? I started my career here in the Still Picture Branch, and one of my projects there was the rehousing and description of a terrific collection of photographs, series 64NA. These photographs are what piqued my curiosity about this place. And the photographs, while they're wonderful to look at, frequently have very vague captions. Where do you get the answers to fill out those stories that those pictures tell? By 2009, I had transferred to the textual processing unit at Archives 2 and discovered the wonderful collection of textual records that tells our story. But when I started searching in our online catalog, I was aghast that I could only find three descriptions for series of textual records among our own holdings. And this was in the National Archives 75th anniversary year. So I asked Jody, my supervisor, if I could start processing Record Group 64. She gave me the go ahead. And off and on over the next year, I was waded into this big, wonderful collection. From that initial foray, I wrote this 2011 blog post for our, the text message blog on the National Archives website, which described the processing effort and provided links to descriptions of many of the earliest collections of our agency's records. But after that first year, other priorities intervened, and the project lay fallow until last fall, when our unit again took up the processing of Record Group 64 this time with a full-time mandate. Four full-timers in our group, plus several students, dove in just in time for the Archives 80th anniversary. And it was from this renewed effort that I was inspired to blog about our work and share my favorite finds for the ICN, our internal collaboration network. For those of you visiting the archives today, the ICN is our agency-wide tool that we use to share information collaborate on projects, and just to stay in touch across the National Archives system across our country, presidential libraries, regional archives facilities, and record centers. On the ICN, our historian, Jesse Kretz, created a space called History of the National Archives, which was a perfect location to share these posts that I created. These blog posts are a hodgepodge of topics that I thought would interest all of you across NARA. Here's a story about Dr. Harold T. Pinkett, our first African-American archivist, who enjoyed a long career here and is the author of several important inventories of our agriculture-related holdings. I've created many such posts, drawing from the fascinating stories within these records. 
And then recently, Lucy Barber at the NHPRC suggested I give a talk about them. And the rest is history. We'll start today with a what might have been. What would a National Archives look like? Here is one artist's conception, a 1930 postcard. The caption notes that the model is available for viewing in the Treasury Department. I would love to know where that model ended up. Here is the program and two tickets for the laying of the cornerstone of this building, the National Archives building in 1933. One ticket is for general admission and one is for VIPs. The Honorable Ogden Mills, Secretary of the Treasury, spoke at the ceremony because Treasury's Public Building Service was responsible for the construction. Here is a view of President Hoover at the Cornerstone Lane, one of his last official acts. And here is a list of objects placed within that cornerstone, including a copy of the program, copies of Washington, D.C. newspapers, and a telephone directory for the Department of the Treasury. I didn't even know the cornerstone was hollow. As work on the building continued, it needed people to fill it up and to run it. Here is the first list of personnel dated May 1935. At this point, the archives existed only as several offices in the Department of Justice building next door. Only 25 employees at this point, all, nearly all of them clerical and administrative. Six division chiefs had been hired, but no other professional staff. From our photo collection 64NA comes this, the first image in that collection, a view of the Constitution Avenue entrance dated August 1935. Money was so tight that the photographer, Harry Baudu, had to borrow the equipment to make this photograph from the US Navy. Now, he had worked with the Navy during World War I, so I imagine he just made some calls. By the fall of 1935, the hiring process was picking up steam. We have a wonderful collection of newspaper clippings, entry P67, that chronicles all of these personnel moves as well as other notable events and issues during these early years. Here are clippings for the appointments of John Russell to the Division of Cataloging, Arthur Kimberly to the Division of Repair and Preservation, and Marcus Price as Assistant Director of Archival Service, all in October 1935. I love the printing of the names that they wrote on the tops of these mount cards. Now, some important things have happened at the archives in the month of October, as you'll soon see. One problem requiring immediate attention was what to call our agency. Now, of course, we had a name. Heck, it's on the National Archives Act. But Congress had a hard time remembering what to call us. Here is memorandum number one issued to our employees. The archivist suggests that members of the staff form the habit, whether in conversation or in writing, to use the correct designation, the National Archives. Several years later, the matter came up again with a slight change. This memorandum of May 1943 declared that the word the will no longer be considered a part of the title of the National Archives. And its use in the expression, the National Archives, will not be a reason for capitalizing the initial letter. Now you're probably thinking, huh? <laughs> to learn about how these memos came about, you need only look at this number here on the lower corner of all of these memorandums. This is the case file number for its related planning and control case file, what we call P and C cases. Those case files will tell you everything you need to know about how a memorandum got created. And some of those files are very interesting. Now, I haven't had time to research this particular gem, but I will soon. So back to our story. Now we have a building. Let's find those imperiled records. An early 1935, before the archives building was ready for occupancy, a division of accessions was established. Teams of examiners fanned out across the DC area to find and survey those government records, either for transfer to our permanent holdings 
or to dispose of as useless papers. Here is a daily report from Deputy Examiner Nelson Blake recounting a visit to the White House garage, which was actually a few blocks away from the White House. This garage was chock full of records from a whole lot of agencies, both civilian and military. We sent a photographer along to record the spectacle. Here we see some War Department records crammed into the wall beside a ramp in that garage. Unbelievable. <laughs> the process of surveying and reporting on these vast collections of documents continued throughout 1935, but we couldn't bring the records into the building because it wasn't open yet. On November 12, 1935, the building was open to the staff, which began occupying the offices. Archivist of the United States, R.D.W. Connor, welcomed the staff to its new home with this address at a special assembly that day. In it, Connor gave a brief history of the pre-National Archives period, offered as a description of the many features of the new building, and closed with, at last, Congress has acted with the liberality of ideas and breadth of vision characteristic of a great nation. It has caused to be erected this archives building, which in spaciousness of size, in beauty of design, and in completeness of equipment will provide a fitting home for the priceless documents which make up our nation's archives. It has created an administrative establishment and invested it with the powers ample for the functions to be performed. He closed with, in these acts, Congress has challenged all those who have proclaimed their interest in these problems. Whether or not the National Archives will be one worthy of the nation or not now depends on the manner in which you and I shall meet that challenge. So with that exhortation echoing in their ears, our staff got down to work. Now the first records taken in by the archives in these first few years were refugees. Their current homes were either being demolished, like this one belonging to the alcohol tax unit of the Bureau of Internal Revenue, or their space was needed for other business. These are records of the U.S. Food Administration from World War I, which had been found at the White House garage. Space in the garage was needed for, of all things, vehicles. Here they are being loaded onto a truck on December 21, 1935 and being received at the loading dock here. These were the first records that the archives brought in. After they arrived, the records were fumigated and then dusted to remove any traces of vermin. These are Veterans Administration records which arrived at the archives in June 1936. One delivery of records that made the news happened in early 1937 when the War Department transferred records of the Quartermaster Department from, from Schoolkill Arsenal in Pennsylvania to the archives. Here is a view of the convoy awaiting unloading. The process required 72 trucks, two, it moved 240,000 pounds of records, and it took a week. What makes this delivery important is, was that it was the first time we took in records from outside the DC area. Deputy examiners had surveyed the records at the arsenal but recommended that all of the records be transferred to the archives so that they could be properly sorted. By this point, we had a lot of records in the building, and the staff was working hard at organizing and housing them. All that was left to do was to open the doors to researchers, or as they were called in the early days, investigators. For the occasion of welcoming our very first investigator, the archives had a photo op. Colonel Thomas M. Spaulding signed in his name in the register on October 21, 1936. That's Nelson Vance Russell, the chief of the Division of Reference, on the left. And here's that very register, preserved in our collection. Now, it looks as if this October 21st date was a sneak preview, because the next visitor doesn't arrive until November 2nd. The volume itself is entitled Register of Investigators. Here's the cover of a 1939 circular we issued with an eye-catching layout of the, national, of the search room complex. 
and a view of investigators in the central search room about 1940. Note the sign, silence. Our story is as much about the things we work with as the things that we have done. I mentioned earlier that I was curious about the containers the archives used in the early days. As I processed these records, I learned about the metal document trays that were the first receptacles for this incoming torrent of paper records. When records first started arriving at the building, they were just piled onto the floor of whatever stack area was available. The shelving hadn't even been installed yet. Here is an article from the Sunday Roto-Gravure section of the Milwaukee Journal from 1938 showing the new trays installed and ready for use. Our collection of newspaper clippings has many such wonderful illustrated articles. Here are two staff members placing records into these new trays about 1938. Our Center for Legislative Archives still uses the trays for its holdings today. Here is archivist Rod Ross going through one of them back in 2002. The metal trays were useful, certainly, but circumstances all too soon forced the archives to seek alternative types of containers. Metal was expensive. The documents were difficult to access. Reaching down into them like that frequently caused damage. And the flat filing of documents consumed enormous amounts of space. In October 1941, samples of cardboard containers arrived for evaluation by our custodial units. Here is one T.R. Schellenberg's opinion as to their usefulness. More suitable for flat filing, as the documents would tend to crumple if stored vertically. And he concluded with, flat filing, it seems to me, is to be highly recommended for the great proportion of government records. Well, whether filed flat or vertically, response to these new containers was mostly positive, and plans went forward for the design and bidding for these containers. Here is an engineering drawing provided with the bid solicitation. There are dimensions for letter size, legal size, and half size letter boxes on this drawing. Is anyone here from Buffalo or Syracuse? Well, if you were, you've probably heard of Remington Rand. They made typewriters, filing cabinets, safes, and all manner of office equipment before World War II. During the war, the company would make firearms, and ammunition, and our first cardboard containers. Here is a follow-up letter for their bid, dated January 1942, and the container. The staff immediately put these boxes to work. This is a view from July 1942 of archivist Bess Glenn and her staff using the new product to transfer Navy records from their filing cabinets. You can see the entire process here. A card of brand new boxes, filled box, labeling the box, and carting it up with the other records ready to put on the shelf. But there were some problems with these first generation boxes. The brass rivets used to attach the leather pull tabs frequently failed. Here is a memo about this problem from one of the custodial units. W.R. Willoughby wrote, when the tabs pulled off, it was found in nearly every case that the rivet was not properly spread. On this example, you can see the leather pull tab has a hole. This was where the original rivet failed. The box and its tab were sent back to Remington Rand and re-riveted. Also on this box are two examples of the earliest kinds of box labels that we used. And our stacks still hold hundreds, if not thousands, of these very containers. So they're still very useful. As great as it is to read the documents in Record Group 64, all manner of memos, reports, bulletins, and letters, and immerse yourself in all the goings on of these exciting times, I was frustrated that we didn't have many photographs of the people who were written about or who created these documents. Wouldn't it be great to be able to place a face with a name? The ID card. Every federal employee has one. Here's an image from a 1941 Graflex catalog showing the camera setup they sold just for this purpose. 
Now, ID cards of employees are not something you'd expect to find in the records by the time they make their way to our holdings. But last year, rooting around in the records of our old division of personnel and payroll, I came across these paper-wrapped bundles. Opening them up, I discovered photo ID cards of National Empl Archives employees from 1941, nearly 250 of them. Clerks, messengers, archivists, they're all here. There is Philip Brooks up there, who later became director of the Truman Library. Faye Gieselin was the secretary to the Archivist of the United States. And Louis Darter and Bess Glenn were archivists who wrote some important early inventories of our holdings. Even the staff of the new FDR library are here. All seven of them, including two for director Fred Shipman. There's even a card for FDR's cousin. If you saw Ken Burns' series, The Roosevelt's, you may remember FDR's cousin, Margaret Daisy Suckley. She was on the payroll at the library as a junior archivist. Here's a mention of her in a January 1947 issue of our employee newsletter, Archive Views. As we go along today, we'll see more of these people preserved for posterity in these small laminated treasures. There are also a few cards for WPA workers who were employed here in the flattening of some two million trifolded pension records. In this photo, they're using electrically operated laundry mangles to flatten the records. This project lasted almost four years. The business of processing these records generates stories in and of itself. I'd like to share with you one particular story of how we created some order out of the chaos for these records as we made them available for research. It would have been too much to hope for that all the files would be in their correct series, all neat and tidy, because our staff are human. Over the years, our records have been pulled for reports, for talks, for exhibits, and they've never always quite made their way back to where they came from. And then they get swept up into boxes and end up with us. Here's one example of how I was able to locate the proper home for some records. Several of these issuances surfaced, all with the same batch of initials in the upper right-hand corner. Now, we have a full record set of these issuances, so this particular bunch of copies needed to go back into the records of the unit from whose initials these people worked. How do I find out which unit that was? I checked the April 1947 phone book. How convenient. It's from the same month as these issuances. I took the first initials, LJH, and scanned the listings and found Lyle J. Hoverstock. His office symbol is FI. From there, I checked the building directory on the inside cover of the phone book and found that FI stands for the Fiscal Branch of the General Records Office. Since some of the initials on this document were indecipherable, I scanned the listings in the directory for this office symbol, FI. And I put names to those other initials. There, I just identified the entire staff of an office and I was able to file those issuances back where they belong. And there have been many such cases like this. These phone books and building directories have been worth their weight in gold. If there's one unifying element in the life of an organization, it is the memorandum. From the vital all-hands announcement to the routine reminders and admonishments within an office itself, it is a wonderful resource for discovering how the National Archives evolved. Here's a selection of them that you might find interesting. Now, how would you like to arrive at work and find this in your mailbox? You are requested to let me have by hand, either in pencil or ink, a brief statement, not over 150 words, of exactly what you do each day in connection with your official duties. 
You may use your own judgment as to the form with which to present this information. I must have a statement by 10.30 o'clock today. This is from Mr. Thomas Owen, the head of the Division of Veterans Administration Archives. Well, the staff hopped to it. Here is junior archivist Eunice White's hastily written reply to Mr. Owen, spelling out exactly what it is that she does, including telephonic consultation with the Veterans Administration. <laughs> Take care of your ink pens. A reminder to clean your pen and replenish your inkwell so they don't become clogged. This is Harry Forker, the chief of the Division of Printing and Processing. You can be sure he took care of his desk set. <laughs> and a very big deal. The announcement of the installation of the first hydrothermographs in our stack areas for recording humidity and temperature from 1939. This is Adelaide Minogue of the Division of Repair and Preservation checking on one of them in 1940. And we still use digital versions of these instruments today. Finally, instructions for erecting and decorating Christmas trees in the building. Among other exhortations, it shall be erected with the base in a watertight vessel containing water or moistened earth extending well above the fresh cut to reduce its inflammability. Now we're going to pause here for a brief commercial break. I mentioned earlier how the ICN has been a great resource for sharing these wonderful finds with everyone across NARA. It has sparked my creativity in ways I could never have imagined. If you haven't been on the ICN yet or not sure how it be, would be useful for you, I encourage you to visit and look around and see what your colleagues are doing with it. Maybe it will inspire you. Happy birthday, National Archives. Now back to our program. So following this theme of creativity, it took everyone's ideas to help grow our agency, and it still does. So much about this was brand new. With this memorandum, an employee suggestion program was established in 1943. A committee would consider the merits of each, suge each suggestion, and those with promise were sent on to the appropriate unit for evaluation. 
Those ideas that worked and, were, and made a significant contribution to the agency were rewarded with cash awards or even a step increase for their originator. The ideas started flowing in. Here is archivist Helen Beach's suggestion for a type of skid cart for moving records around from the loading dock to the stacks. In her suggestion, Beach notes the present shortage of construction materials and suggests using whatever materials may be at hand in the building. We were at war after all. Standard library carts like this one from a 1940 Washington Post story about the National Archives were fine for transporting bound volumes, but they just weren't suitable for moving large quantities of records around. So Helen Beach submitted this drawing for a cart with removable shelves to accommodate different quantities and sizes of containers or even just loose bundles. Seeing that Beach's idea had merit, the committee sent it around. Here are some thoughts from senior cabinet maker Cleo Getz. He wrote, the only thing to do is to decide on some kind of a truck and have a sample built and try it out. It next went to engineering draftsman Alexander Stiles, who worked the idea into this final form, with casters on each side and slats for two removable shelves. The carpenter shop got the go-ahead to build a prototype. The staff loved it, and more were made. It became known as the beach cart. Some of these are still found in the building. Although its shelves are long gone, this one can still move records around, although Kirsten Holm tells me that its wheels are still somewhat arthritic. Another idea the committee considered was this one from Thomas Owen of the Division of Veterans Administration Archives. How about a photo directory of the staff? The idea went around the building. But Bess Glenn effectively put the kibosh on it with this priceless comment. My own archival photograph, I cannot resist saying, makes me look like a matron of a women's prison who has at last succumbed to her environment. <laughs> well, not every idea is destined to be adopted. But we haven't heard the last from this beach. Two years after her skid guard idea, inspiration born of frustration struck again. Getting into the box as well in a narrow stack was very difficult. Beach proposed a rolling table with a shelf that could hold a box and still provide a flat space for your letters when answering reference requests. Here is the sketch she provided with her suggestion. She proposed attaching a retractable step that is commonly used on kitchen stools. Again, her suggestion was passed along to the carpenter shop, which produced this more refined drawing. Beach's idea of a retractable stool was changed to a, become a portable stool stored on a shelf underneath. The table was built, it was evaluated by various units, and was deemed so useful that the archivist, Wayne Grover, awarded Beach $25, which was a tidy sum for 1948. Here's the story in the employee newsletter, Archive Views. Does that table look familiar to any of you staff? It should, because quite a few of them are still around today in this very building and are just as useful as when they are when they were new. I'm sure Ms. Beach would be thrilled to know that her ideas and inventions have endured. As if we didn't have enough to handle with surveying, accessioning, classifying, and cataloging the records and helping researchers, the archives was soon forced to face the consequences of imminent world conflict. After the passage of the Burke-Wadsworth Bill Act in, 19, in September 1940, we underwent the first draft registration in this country since World War I. This image from the October 27, 1940 Washington Post shows the first day's draft registration cards being brought into the archives building. Many archives employees joined the military services when even before our country became involved. And being one of the tiniest agencies, we would eventually attain the highest percentage of military participation of any of them. Here is an honor roll of our staff members, then in the service from about 1943.
There are 117 names up there. The staff exodus to the armed services increased drastically after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Here, recorded in Executive Officer Collis Harris's daily diary entry for December 8, 1941. It notes that a new staff committee on the protection against the hazards of war was established that morning, and it listened as a body to President Roosevelt's declaration of war barely two hours later. The declaration of war against the Axis changed everything for the archives. Suddenly we were planning for the protection of the records, organizing civil defense and first aid response in the event of an attack, and generally putting our agency on a wartime footing. Here is Collis Harris's card file he maintained while serving as a defense coordinator for the archives. Employees received this memo on April 30th, 1942, outlining the procedure to be followed in case of an air raid. Throughout the year and the war, more such memos would be posted on bulletin boards around the building. Soon, Harris's office established staff training courses for civilian defense. Here is a schedule of courses, fire defense, gas defense, and first aid. Here are the graduates of the first civilian protection school which trained our staff, dated August 24th, 1942. They are holding their certificates and their civilian defense handbooks. Regular air raid drills honed the skills of the staff. Here is a report of one such drill submitted by Howard Gardner. Firefighting parties like this one were stationed throughout the building. Here are Jackson Loving and Jerry Gaither with their equipment in the Division of Repair and Preservation. By the fall of 1942, the archives was on its way to establish an effective response to most any calamity. The clipping files contain articles like this, a Sunday picture spread highlighting the measures undertaken to safeguard the building and its precious records. Vigilance, drill, and Improvement to procedures and equipment would occupy the staff for the remainder of the war. What is interesting is that many of the photographs seen in these clippings are in 64NA, that series of photographs. Newspapers provided us with prints as a courtesy, but they didn't always provide captions with those prints. So this makes a wonderful use for these clipping files because in several cases I've been able to identify staff members from the captions in these clippings. In the early years of the archives, office heads kept daily diaries of their activities. These are a great day-by-day -day chronicle of all the goings-on. Here's a page from the daily diary of Marcus Price, the assistant director of archival service from December of 1935. No bit of business was too small to escape his notice. Along with accounts of letters he sent, reports he read, and meetings he arranged, Price reported the slingshot hole in my office window. Was that really a slingshot hole? <laughs> now, it's not every day that a photography master walks into the door. Here's an excerpt from the Daily Diary for the Division of Photographic Archives and Research, noting the visits of Ad Ansel Adams in August 1941. He was there to look through the Matthew Brady collection of Civil War prints and select and print a few images for an exhibit that the Museum of Modern Art was planning. And sometimes you just find little things that make you smile. The poor typist in the Division of Exhibits and Publications had a hard time remembering what year it was. It starts out in 1946, lapses back to 1945 for a few days, then 1946 again, back to 1945. By January 10th, 1946 is here to stay. You expect to see a lot of cool things when you scrabble through the records at the National Archives, but you don't necessarily expect to find your kin. Now, this story starts a while back. 
when I was a young, bright-eyed guy. <laughs> That's me with Kevin Tiernan as we awaited a truck during the move to Archives 2 back in 1994. One of my projects in the old still picture branch was the holdings maintenance on this collection of photographs from the Office of War Information, series 208 PU. Some 200 boxes worth of photographs of notable personalities needed new folders and boxes. This was a fun assignment. <laughs> Toward the end of that project, I had a jaw-dropping moment when I came across this photo. This glam lady happens to be my great uncle's mother. Lucy Salamanca. What was she doing in there? And it shows just how little you know about your own family. She wrote a history of the Library of Congress entitled Fortress of Freedom. And she was a section head at the library's legislative reference service. Here is an excerpt about her and the book from the library's website. Well, that was cool enough. But what should I come across while processing RG64 but this, a December 1936 article by Lucy in the Evening Star. Beauty and efficiency found in archive setting. Most perfect system is created. I sent copies of these amazing finds to her grandson who lives nearby in Maryland. He was thrilled to have these because he didn't know about them either. One of the vital activities of the archives during the war was, of course, safeguarding not only the records of, in our custody, but also helping agencies to protect the records in their care. One potential hazard to many agencies, including ours, were the vast collections of cellulose nitrate-based motion picture film they had in storage. Here is a 1936 view of sound engineer Glenn Henry with their with, these, with film in these special cases built to protect the collection from the danger of a nitrate explosion. The risks of housing this unstable and potentially explosive material in metropolitan Washington with the threat, however remote, of enemy attack were incalculable. So in early 1942, a team from the Division of Motion Pictures and Sound Recordings went out into the Virginia countryside to survey possible sites for off-site storage for these film collections. One candidate was the Luray Caverns out in the Shenandoah Valley. This is a report from that trip. Can you imagine storing tremendous quantities of potentially explosive material inside a geological treasure? <laughs> Fortunately, the team kept looking. A few weeks later, they surveyed a building at the Manassas Battlefield, an old estate, and an old fort. This is the report from that second trip. For various reasons, distance, lack of suitable buildings, all of the candidates were rejected in favor of Fort Hunt, 15 miles south of DC near Alexandria, Virginia. Here is a view of Battery Mount Vernon, the largest of the four gun batteries there. This photo was taken during that survey trip. The old fort, which had given up its guns in 1917, had since housed an Army Finance School, a Civilian Conservation Corps encampment, and various other activities. The batteries themselves contained many small rooms suitable for storing film, although they would need a lot of repairs and improvements to make them usable. The Archives Division of Building Management and Service produced architectural drawings show the, showing the improvements to be made for each of the old gun batteries in preparation for film storage. Here is a drawing for Battery Porter, one of the smaller batteries, showing the layouts for three film storage rooms. Meanwhile, the Committee on Conservation of Cultural Resources, chaired by Collis Harris, sent a circular, circular letter to all federal and quasi-federal agencies in the DC area, soliciting information about the quantities of nitrate-based film they had in their collections and inviting them to store these records at Fort Hunt during the, for the duration of the war. Here is a reply from the Smithsonian Institution indicating it had no motion pictures, but it did have still picture negatives, which were nitrate-based. Once the storage vaults at Fort Hunt were ready for occupancy, the archives began to move its and other agencies' collections out there. This is a service order for accommodation storage 
of the Smithsonian's negatives. The archives loaded its trucks with nitrate film and transported them to Fort Hunt. Note the fire extinguisher and the danger explosives sign on the bumper. Now here's an interesting tidbit. Note the license plate, number three on the truck. Guess what we have in our holdings? Number two. Why? That's anyone's guess. <laughs> our holdings also include a sample of the pass required on staff visits to the vaults at Fort Hunt in order to check on conditions. And conditions were pretty lousy. The fort was right next to the Potomac River, and the rooms were damp. We installed ventilation tubes and calcium chloride canisters, but they weren't much help. With the end of the war, the off-site storage program was terminated, and the archives sent letters to agencies to re requesting them to remove their film from the vaults. Here is a letter from De Deputy uh, Director of Operations Marcus Price to the Department of the Treasury, directing their agency to remove all of its film from the fort by November 30th, 1946. By this point, we had already returned our records back to the archives building, and plans were underway to duplicate these films onto safer stock. Now, I happen to live about five minutes from Fort Hunt, which today is part of the National Park Service. Here are some recent views of Battery Mount Vernon, 1942 and 2013. People, especially kids, love to clamber around these old gun batteries. Note the old no smoking signs, still visible after 70 years. All of the vault openings are now sealed off for safety. So there are a few of our origin stories. There are so many more stories I would love to discover and share with you. The development of our inventories and guides, the evolution of our print du duplication processes for records, such as photostatting and microfilming, not to mention the stories of all of the people who have made this agency. We'll just have to do this again. But in the meantime, here's wishing you all a happy and safe Halloween. Thank you all very much. And a big thank you to Jesse Kratz, Lucy Barber, Marie Maxwell, Kirsten Holm, Anonymous, she knows who she is, and to all of you on the ICN. And for a treat, we have brought some of the artifacts I talked about today. Please come down and have a look.